So recall from ARO 300 and MATH 244 that the roots of an ODE characteristic equation are in general complex numbers. And we could write the solution out, we saw this the other day, that we could write the solution out as the sum of the uh, exponentials of those roots. And also, uh, there are always as many roots to the characteristic equation as there are derivatives. So the number of roots is equal to the order of the ordinary differential equation. So uh, for example, we had a first order ODE that was like x dot equals uh, minus tau x. Then the characteristic equation, which we often use capital F, would be this lambda plus tau equals zero. And so then the root would be just minus tau. Um, we had, so that was, that's first order. Second order, we end up with things like x lambda squared plus b lambda plus c equals zero. And that has obviously roots just given by the quadratic equation, negative b plus or minus squared of <coughs> b squared minus 4 c c my a all over 2. And uh, notice up here, these are always going to be real valued roots, all right? Um, because tau is a real number, and so it's either just a positive or negative uh, real number. But down here, we can now start to see that we would get complex numbers because this b squared minus 4 c inside the uh, exponential, or sorry, inside the square root may or may not be positive. If it's negative, then you would take the square root and get the imaginary number, and so on. Um, and then there's also third order and so on, but uh, we're going to kind of concern ourselves with the first and second, because third order is then just uh, you take the first and second, and what we're going to see is you just keep adding more first orders on, and the response is like the same. Um, let's look at the, the first order uh, differential equation. So let me create a new page. Uh, so, so by way of example, let's look at the first order ODE, and let's look at what we had there. We had to say dy dt is equal to minus tau y. Then, as we just wrote down the other day, lambda plus tau is equal to zero. That is the character equation. And then we say, okay, fine, lambda is going to equal to minus tau. And uh, it's always going to be a real number because it comes from a real physical uh, problem. So the homogeneous solution, yh, would just be some initial condition times e to the minus t over tau. So we could go ahead and plot the location of these poles in the complex plane, and we're going to do this if there are and what I mean by that is we have, say, the complex plane. And that's the real part plotted against the imaginary part. And whatever it is we're looking at, we're looking at uh, So there would be a pole there, or the pole would be there. I'm sorry, I keep saying pole. I'm going to use the word pole and root in a change of it. And you'll see why I'm inside. Um, here, this is uh, y equals y naught uh, e to the t over tau, because this is the case where tau is less than zero. But since it's uh, lambda equals minus tau, you get minus minus the x that we're using in the whole lot here. Here, this is the case where tau is greater than zero, and we have y equals y naught e to the minus t over tau. So in this solution, we have k, and this, this is growth. Right? So in this very simple case, <coughs> we've seen that we saw this before when we looked at solutions to first order differential equations. The depending on the sign of tau, whether it's positive or negative, we'll either get exponential decay or we'll get exponential growth. Um, and that's the homogeneous response to some offset, some initial conditions. Um, so we can the location of this root tells us a lot about the response of the system. Okay, either it stays Bounded, it goes to zero or it goes, goes off to infinity uh, at some exponential rate. We can look at second order ODEs. So for second order ODEs, then we know that 
the character's equation is lambda squared lambda squared plus d lambda plus c equal to that delta of lambda equals zero. And uh, we know that the, the roots then, as we wrote before, are just negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared plus 4c all over 2. And as we did before for b and c, let's let, if we're talking about a um, mass spring damper system, so let b equal 2 zeta omega n c b omega squared. So this is for a mass spring damper system. Then what we found from before was that lambda 1 and 2 is equal to um, negative zeta omega n plus or minus j times omega n times the square root of 1, 1 minus zeta squared. And this was for zeta between 0 and 1. And also remember that j is equal to the square root of minus 1, which we refer to as i to the negative. Um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, well, let zeta omega n equals sigma. This is just to make our life easier. And omega n times square root of 1 minus zeta squared. We'll call that omega d. Uh, zeta, I'm sorry, sigma here is, doesn't really have a name, but it really is uh, about our response time. And we're going to see that when we look at uh, uh, the system in more detail in a couple weeks. And this here has, uh, it's called the uh, damped frequency. Or damped, net, damped frequency. And so, right, omega n is the natural frequency, and so this zeta here has something to do with the damping ratio, so you multiply 1 minus zeta squared to the root times the natural frequency, you get the damping frequency. Alright, so now we can plot this in the complex plane. And so we would have then the real part, and really we're looking at the real part of lambda versus the imaginary part. In general, we could say, all right, well, let's say there's one there and one there. These are the roots. And notice this is for zeta omega n positive, which we have because omega n is always positive, and here zeta is between zero and one. So I'm going to have uh, the there's always going to be uh, a negative real part to this, and we're going to analyze that um, further down the road. But a lot of times, what we'll be interested in is that there's going to be, this is say plus omega d, and then there's minus omega d, and then here's the uh, minus, uh, or this, the distance here, I said that way, is sigma. And we can draw a line, or you know, an arrow, out to the uh, roots there, and we're going to call this angle the theta. Um, these, remember, uh, remember from your complex days are called phasers, right? So they're kind of like, uh, they have something to do with phase. We'll, we'll talk more about that again uh, if, you, if you don't recall, but um, it, yeah, when you plot a uh, vector essentially in a complex plane, it's known as a phaser. Um, <coughs> notice that the angle uh, theta here can be given by taking the tangent of theta. And that's equal to right opposite over adjacent. So it's omega d over sigma. And omega d is omega n squared 1 minus zeta squared all over uh, sigma, which is uh, zeta over omega n. Those cancel. And I'm left with square root of 1 minus zeta squared over theta. So the angle theta only depends on the damping of the shield sigma. And that, again, is a relationship we're going to explore. Um, if you have more damping, right, so you have zeta is closer to 1, 
for it, or potentially greater than, but at least greater than, then you know you would expect this uh, angle to change, and we'll see. We'll be able to see how that works. Um, so it turns out that when you go through all the cases here, because remember there were seven cases about zeta um, in terms of whether or not the solution uh, was was bounded or not, but um, we can summarize this. So recall, recall seven cases for zeta. <coughs> then it turns out that we can summarize this that if zeta is positive, then the limit for y of t, so that's the solution to the differential equation as t goes to infinity, is equal to zero. If zeta is negative, then the limit for y of t as t goes to infinity is goes to infinity. So in the case where zeta is positive, you get something that if you have some initial condition goes to zero, and if it's negative, say it's negative and some initial conditions, then the solution goes up to infinity. Um, you can, what I'm essentially saying here is if you were to plot t and y of t, then for starting at some initial condition, then for zeta uh, positive, you're going to you know, go down to zero. For zeta uh, negative, you're going to go off to infinity. And we'll have to see how all this uh, works uh, by looking at the solution in the differential equation and looking at what we're going to call stability. All right, so why did I start this lecture out by saying that the, the poles of system relate to response? Well, it turns out that if we have the complex plane, I'm really just redrawing the picture we had, which is the imaginary part. And here are those roots of the characteristic equation. We refer to the roots, so that's the roots of cap lambda. Those are also known as the poles of the ODE. Right? And we're going to see where this term poles comes from. Uh, it has to do with complex analysis and what we call the transfer function. But it's also, we can just call it controls jargon. Okay. In the same way that we use J to represent the uh, complex numbers of I, uh, the poles of the ODE are also referred to as the roots. So it's really the same thing. Um, and another thing we're going to actually see is that if you have the roots of the characters equation, some set of those things, there's say two or three or four of them. Those are equal to the poles of the ODE. And it turns out they're also equal to the eigenvalues of the ODE. And you may have seen this in uh, math 244. The eigenvalues of a differential operator, essentially what we're looking at, are, uh, we, we have to see what those are, but that's a abstract mathematical generalization of the idea of poles or roots of uh, that characteristic. 